Greetings, I am Herbert Erpaderp, and today I'm going to build this King Tiger from Rubicon Models. This is a kit that a lot of people were excited about, myself included, and I'll say it now, I think that excitement was justified. It's pretty cool. I did have a look at what's inside the box when I received the kit, and that was a while ago now, but if you would like to have a closer look at the sprues, there's a link to that video in the description below. Feel free to pause this and go check it out. Okay, let's get right into gluing bits of plastic together. The instructions said to start with the wheels, and I thought, you know, that's a really good idea. The first thing to do is glue the main sets of wheels together. These come as sets of four, one inner and one outer. The arched bits of plastic connecting the wheels are meant to be there, and they won't be visible once the wheels are all together, and they make it much easier to put together and have everything line up nice and neat than if they were individual parts. Next I glue together a pair of single wheels. This is just as simple as the other wheels, there's just less of them. There's a pair of guide pins on the back of this wheel assembly, and corresponding holes in the front of the main wheel set. This one having only two guide pins is an end part, and it goes on the end. There are also a bunch of single wheel sets with four guide pins on the back, and those go into the middle here like so. You can glue the two wheel halves together before putting them onto the main set, or you can do it how I did. And of course there's another end wheel part with the two pins for the other end as well. We end up with this nice neat set of wheels. They look really good. Continuing with the wheels, I make two for idling. I think I'll call them idler wheels. These are made up of three parts, with keying to ensure that all three parts line up correctly. This will be important when it comes time to add the track links. The drive sprocket comes next, and this is a simple two part assembly with keying in the form of both guide pins and a D shape. Double keying for double the pleasure? Yeah, why not? Speaking of tracks, let's add some to the drive sprocket. This is simple enough and you can see that there are some guide slots on the inside of the sprocket here. The thing to be careful of here is that you need to leave one guide slot empty when installing these. This will be a guide for the upper run of tracks. Pay attention to the instructions and you shouldn't have a problem. Putting the tracks onto the idler wheel is more or less the same. The tracks are guided by keying and you need to leave one guide slot empty towards the front of the wheel. This will also fit the upper run of tracks. One of the slightly longer lengths of track should also be glued onto the idler wheel at this point. This is the side of the lower hull. Thanks Captain Obvious! You're welcome. Onto this I glue the final drive housing. It goes on nice and neat and easy thanks to the keying. Then I put that aside and attach the lower run of tracks to the road wheels. There's a couple of little notches that you can see in there, and those will link in with some tabs on top of some of the guide horns on the tracks. This means you get the tracks in exactly the right spot, and the guide parts are hidden within the wheels. Nice design. Now I glue the road wheels onto the hull side part. The wheels go onto the axially bits, which is where you would expect them to go. The fit is nice and easy. The idler wheel with its pre-installed tracks can then go into place, and this is keyed so you don't really have to do too much to get things all lined up nice and neat. This is followed by the drive sprocket which is also keyed and also, unsurprisingly, has a nice neat fit. I then add the length of tracks that runs between the drive sprocket and lower run of tracks. And once again, it's a nice easy fit with no difficulties. The top run of tracks is made up of two parts which pretty much just drop right into place. Though with the shorter length toward the front, I did have to apply some upward pressure to get the parts to stay together properly. A very minor complaint but it is worth noting. As far as link and length tracks go, these are some of the best I've ever seen. The keying makes sure that everything fits together well, and I think it would be quite hard to mess this up. You would have to put some effort into it. Next we take the lower hull part and put a spherical magnet into the little raised bit for it. The magnet is included with the kit, which is nice. I actually glued this into place and I think that was a bit of a mistake. You can't really tell and it's not enough of a problem to stop the turret from going into place, but the polarity of my magnets was a little bit off kilter. The magnet will be held in place when you glue in the interior floor part anyway, though it does rattle a bit and that is why I glued the magnet in. What I'm trying to say here is glue it in if you want, but be a bit more careful with the magnetic polarity than I was. Attaching the tracks to the lower hull part seemed like a good idea, so that's what I did. There's a couple of tabs on the top of the hull side part that link into some slots on the hull part. 
They're not huge, but they do function as they should, though it is easy to knock out of place. The instructions did mention not to add the wheels and tracks and such, suggesting that the hull sides be glued on without those to make painting easier, I assume, but I'm pretty sure that I can paint all of this while it's assembled, so I'm just going to ignore that. What a rebel. The next thing I did was to attach these here shackles at the front of the hull. The instructions tell us not to glue them, and I decided to stop being a rebel because I figured if they were glued and happened to interfere with the upper hull parts I would be annoyed. I don't want to be annoyed. They don't interfere, but I left them unglued anyway. The fit is tight enough that they shouldn't fall off unless you're exceptionally rough. Now it's time to put stuff on the rear plate, like this jack. There should be two mounting tabs on this and it's pretty easy to get the part into place, but you'll notice that my jack only has one tab. I wasn't totally sure if I accidentally clipped this off and didn't remember it, or if it was never there in the first place. The part does still go onto the model just fine anyway, so not a big deal. Exhaust pipes come next, and these are quite simple to install. They have some simple tabs that fit into the little slots on the plate part and you just slide them in. Just try to avoid putting them on upside down. There is a little bit of play in these parts so you might need to do a bit of nudging, but I doubt that's going to be much of a hindrance for you. This piece, suspected of being a jacking block, goes here on the upper right. Nice and easy. Then the rear mudguards go into place. There are nice little recesses into which they fit pretty much perfectly. Next, the cover things for the lower portion of the exhaust go into place. These have guide pins to guide them, and there's no difference between the pins on these. However, the one with the little brackety detail on the bottom of it should be installed on the right hand side. Now that the rear plate has its various doodads installed, why not glue that into place? This is quite easy to do. I apply a bit of extra glue to make sure that the glue god is smiling upon me. And now to anger the glue god. I attach some more shackles, again without any glue. They were a bit fiddly to get into place here, and I think it would be easier to do this without the rear mudguards in place. Now we move on to the upper hull, and depending on which tools you would like to install, you'll need to drill some holes. I didn't film myself drilling these, but surely you've seen what drilling holes looks like before. I've made holes for all of the tools, but I do like the option to not do that, and also not have to fill in the mounting holes for tools that you've left off. The tools in question include a hammer for when it's hammer time, which is one of the more important times in a tanker's day. There's also an axe for when questions arise and must be axed. There's also a set of wire cutters because everybody likes to have a good wire cutting session from time to time, and German tankers are no exception. I follow this by attaching the plate into which the front hatches will mount. This is simple enough, though if you want to be real fancy, you could leave this unglued so that you could remove it to show the interior. I've chosen not to do that for reasons. The reasons mostly being that I would probably just lose the part. Next I install this fire extinguisher. I would have done that with the other tools, if you count a fire extinguisher as a tool, but I almost forgot about it. Here's another part that you can leave unglued for better interior visibility, the engine deck. Again I've glued this on, but I did have the thought of modelling it open. However the inside isn't detailed, so I chose not to. My interior is going to be visible anyway because I plan to leave the top of the hull unglued. This hatch goes into the opening on the engine deck plate and again I was considering modelling it open, but the lack of detail on the inside of it made me change my mind. It does look pretty good in the closed position though, so I'm not going to complain. The front hatches seemed like a fun thing to install next and I guess they were. I've decided to model these open, which is a bit unusual for me, but I do think it will be cool to see the interior, even if it's just a little bit through these hatches. The photo etch parts come next. These aren't anything too fancy and no bending is required, but they do look good. Because this is metal we need to use super glue to secure them in place. Plastic cement just doesn't work with metal, strangely enough. This isn't too difficult to do, though do pay attention to the shape of the parts. The rectangular ones have a particular way they should go on, which good old Herbert failed to notice at first. But as you can see I did fix my mistake. The round grills go into place in the round fan venti things, as you might expect, and these fit nicely as well. There are another couple of photo etch grills and these, actually all of them are optional, so you aren't required to add any of them, but why not? Anyway, there's a couple of other grills with plastic surrounds that you could add if you wanted. However, as you can probably tell, I chose not to. 
Moving along, it's time to deal with the whole side parts. These are separate plates, which I believe is to simplify the moulding process for making two King Tigers. This one and the one with Zimmerit. Like with the upper hull part, you need to drill out various holes according to which tools you would like to mount. And again, I'm going to mount all of them. So we add towing cables because sometimes you've just got to tow some stuff, a shovel because sometimes you just need to dig a hole for pooping in, and then this thing which I suspect might be the crank starting crank. All of these are nice and easy to get into place, just don't drill the holes too big. Let's not forget this bar which goes into place here. Good old bar, how could we forget you? This goes on just as easily as all the previous parts, which is to say very easily. The result is a nice looking King Tiger hull side, which is just what I wanted. There is obviously another one of these and just like the left one, you need to drill holes if you want to add all of the cables. Turns out I did want to add all of the cables. Next, the upper frontal plate. Before attaching this to the tank we need to install this part, which is the machine gun housing. It will be impossible to get this into place after the front plate is on the hull, so do it now. Then why not attach the hull side parts? The model isn't going to look right without them. These go into place easily, and you can see there's some guide slots to help with positioning. I apply upward pressure to make sure that these aren't sitting too low, and it does look like there's a bit of a gap along the top, but I do think that's meant to be there. Remember that front plate? Well, I put the thing into the back of it a few moments ago. Anyway, I glue it into place now, and this is pretty easy. You can see how the interlocking plates go together at the front, and instead of having the slight gaps there moulded into the part, they're real gaps. The two final shackles then go into place at the rear of the hull, like so. Again, no glue. May the glue god forgive me. The barrel of the hull machine gun goes into place next, right where you would expect it. A little bit of nudging, and then we've got a hull machine gun to mow down the enemy infantry with. To illuminate things, though probably not all that well, I give the tank a headlamp. This mounts into the little recess like so. It is now time for skirts. Something I like about these is they've got these little grooves on the inside, and you can use these as guides if you want to cut some sections of skirt off. I did want to do that. I cut off the rear section on the left side, and as you can see while I'm installing them, the middle section on the right side. Speaking of installing, they're quite easy to get into place. There are convenient guides for them, which work as guides and if you choose to leave them off they work as mounting points, and you are certainly free to leave these off completely. I think that's some pretty thoughtful design. The inner portion of the front mudguards goes on next, and there are some large tabs on the outer part that these mount onto. I found I had to apply a bit of pressure to get these to sit properly against the front of the hull, but I don't think that's a big issue. Let's start working on some of the internal components, like this here turret basket. The cylindrical magnet for the turret goes into the bottom of this, and there's a plastic retaining part that goes over the top of it, and I glue that into place after making sure the magnet is aligned with the one in the hull. The magnetization is totally optional, you don't need to do it, but I do like that the magnets are included with the kit. That sort of thing seems to be a rarity these days. I glue the turret basket into the turret bottom part, and it would be very hard to get this installation wrong. One of the main features of the inside of a King Tiger turret is the friendly end of the main gun. Maybe it's not that friendly, it could probably still hurt you, but it's not the business end. That would be weird if the business end was inside the tank. Anyway, this part consists of two halves, which are easily glued together thanks to our dear friend Keying. The gun mounting bits go on either side of the gun, and they have a little recessed section on one side of them that should face outward. It was a little bit fiddly to get this in with the gun part being nice and straight, but I got there in the end. Or close enough anyway. Why not assemble the gun now? There are three guns included with the kit, but the instructions say to use this specific one. I have no issue with that so I used it. However, I did have an issue getting this into the mantlet part. It's meant to be keyed, and it is, but the parts just won't go together. I used my knife to ever so slightly widen the hole, and then it went right together. Who says you can't solve your problems with a knife? It's a pretty nice looking gun in my opinion, and it's been slide moulded so the end of the barrel is nice and open with no drilling required, and no gluing together of gun barrel parts either. Onto the back of the mantlet part I glue this mantlet back, I guess you might call it. This part will join the inner and outer portions of the gun together, so it's kind of important. 
Now, let's make an engine. Turns out building an engine is a lot easier than I thought it would be. We start by gluing the two halves of the main block part together, which is quite simple, and then the rear end goes on. This does have a guide slot, though the two angled bits at the top will help guide it as well. The front part goes on in more or less the same way. Super simple stuff. The engine's hat comes next, and that is what this is. Trust me, I know about engines. They wear hats. Next, the exhaust bits go on either side. There are guide slots here for these, just be sure to use the correct part for either side. Also, you don't want to put them on backwards. That wouldn't be cool. Once that's done we've got a nice little engine, and instead of installing that in the tank, I glue this thing into place. I think it's a rack of machine gun ammo or something like that, though I'm not sure. It is simple enough to install though. I follow this with the walls for the engine bay. They did need a bit of kajiggering, but they do go into place well enough, though I think I didn't quite get the wall between the engine and fighting compartments all the way down into place. It looks as though it's sitting a tiny bit too high, though I didn't notice that at the time. Let's continue with the internal detail. I glue the steering wheel onto its mount, which is simple enough, though I will say that I kind of wish the driver figure came with the option of having the steering wheel moulded into his hands. That might have made some things a bit easier later on. Then I glue together this centre console, I guess you might call it. One side has radio stuff, and the other has gauges and stuff that will be of interest to the driver. The backrest for the radio man goes into place here, on the right side, because that'll be the side where he sits. And then I install the radio gaugey thing that I just put together. The fit is super easy thanks to the keying. Just make sure that you don't install it backwards. Both the radio man and driver will be quite confused if you do that. The steering wheel goes into place next and this is really easy, especially with the help of some nice tweezers. The time has come to make a nice rack. This one, and all of the subsequent ones as well, are quite simple to put together. Make sure to line up the angled outward facing side and they should end up looking great. This pair of racks full of rounds mount here in the side sponsony area. The fit is good and it's just as easy to put these parts into place as it looks. Instead of working on more racks, I install the engine. This doesn't quite drop right into place, but it almost does. I just had to give it a bit of a nudge. You can see there's a couple of recesses in the bottom of the hull to help guide this part. It looks quite engine-y. I follow this with some radiator and fuel tank parts. There's keying to guide these and it's quite easy to position them, though of course be sure that you are using the correct parts on either side. Next comes this thing which sits in the rear of the engine bay, above the exhaust pipes. Not too sure what it is and the fit was a bit tight but it does go into place. Glue to please the glue god and make sure the part doesn't come out of place and we've got a rather full looking engine compartment. I think this looks really cool. I install this thing next. This has some more of those boxy things on it and it's pretty simple to get into place, though it is a good idea to make sure that it's pressed all the way down. More ammo racks come next and these go together pretty much exactly the same way as the previous two. They also go into place in pretty much the same way, just not into the exact same place. This is surprising to nobody. One or four good racks deserve another two, so I put together even more ammo racks. This one has three layers, otherwise it goes together and is installed in the same way as the previous ones. I'm sorry to disappoint you if you were, for some reason, hoping for something completely different. That's the inside of the hull pretty much completed. I start on the turret innards, which is absolutely the right word, by installing this control wheel. I would assume this one is for the turret traverse. It's not difficult to install and by some great fluke I got this into place with the little knobby bit on it in pretty much exactly the spot where the gunner figure's hand is going to end up being. There's also a seat for the gunner, which doesn't look very comfortable, but it goes into place relatively easily, though this would have been a bit easier to get into place if it was done before gluing the turret basket into place on the bottom of the turret. Here's a backrest for the commander to lean against, and this is simple to get into place. The loader stands up a lot but he does get a seat, and I installed that next. This one was even more fiddly than the gunner's. Definitely would have been easier if the top part of the assembly wasn't there. Oh well, it's in place now, and that's the main thing. I hope you didn't think we were finished with the ammo racks. Gotta have some of those in the turret too. There are two parts that go on the floor at an angle here, and that's pretty simple to put in. 
the rest of the racks will come later. In the meantime, I install this control wheel here. I assume this is so the loader can elevate or depress the gun. Whatever its purpose though, it's pretty easy to put into the mounting hole. Then, this little thing mounts onto the end of the gun below the breech. It doesn't quite lock into place or anything like that, but it is pretty easy to install. On the left side of the gun breech, this, I guess it's a protective shield or something, goes into place. There's a slot for this to mount into which makes things nice and easy. This pair of, I guess, recuperator cylinders or something mount on the top of the gun here. The mounting for this is a bit weird. It does help, but you could easily position this part at a weird angle or too far off to one side. Just don't, I guess. The coaxial machine gun goes into place next, and this is a pretty small sort of fiddly bit. It was a bit difficult to nudge into the correct position owing to its proximity to the gun and the fatness of my fingers, but it has ended up looking neat enough. Let's finish those racks. These are pretty simple of course, you just glue the ammo racks into the little wall part, though obviously you do need to make sure that they're in the right spot. The upper rack has three shells and the lower one holds four. These assemblies go into the turret quite easily, though they do tend to want to not quite sit level. A little pressure will take care of that though. I rather like these ammo racks, and the entire interior of the model really, but it would be nice if they included some that had no ammo in them. Just for a bit of variety and to make it look like the tank is in active combat. Still, it looks pretty good. Now, let's work on the outside of the turret. I glue the turret front into place and this fits quite nicely, though it did need a little bit of pressure just to convince it to stay there. The loader's hatch comes next and I've chosen to model this open. A bit out of character for me, I do like my tanks buttoned down, but like I said before, it'll be nice to catch a glimpse of the interior while the model is all together. These lifting doodads come next. These are small and a little fiddly because of that, but they're not too tricky to get into place. There are three of these, two at the front and one at the rear. Around the commander's cupola I install this ring. There are three tiny guide nubs along the bottom of this to help get the positioning right. This ring would hold a machine gun for anti-air defense, though the kit doesn't include one. Now, why not add the commander's hatch? Again, I've chosen to model this open so that we can see inside, and also because the commander is going to be standing up out of this. I'm not entirely sure if the hatch part should sit so low while it's in the open position, but that's how it sits, so that's how it is. Now, it's time for some spare track links. I actually found these a little bit trickier to get into place than I'd anticipated, though it wasn't that hard. It's just those mounting nubs are kind of small. The parts are all differently numbered, but I'm pretty sure they're actually all the same. So it's probably not that important that you put the correctly numbered parts in the places the instructions indicate, though I did try to do that. The spare track links aren't required and you can leave them off, and if you choose to do that, there are these mounting brackets to install instead. This is a lot more fiddly than the links, but I think it looks cool, so I wanted at least one set. As you can see, on the right side I went with all track links, mostly because it was significantly less fiddly to do that. The turret rear comes next, and this did need a bit of extra cleanup to get a good fit, but it did go into place nicely after that. Once that's in place, the hatch can go on. I didn't glue this into place because I was hoping to make it movable. These big, I'm not sure what you would call them, hinge bits? Whatever. These go over the bars on the hatch part, and I tried to be careful with the glue here so the hatch wouldn't be bonded into place, but just to be sure, I left it in the open position because I want to be able to see into the turret. Turns out that the glue did bond this open, and that's fine really, and that is why I left it in the position I would prefer it to be in. Anyway, that's the turret exterior completed. Also, the entire tank portion of the build completed. Time for crew figures. I'm not going to build all of the figures in this video, that would just add a bunch of extra time, and they all go together pretty much the same way. You glue the head and arms on, that's about it. Not all of the arms are a great fit, but a little bit of putty later on will take care of that. Some of them, like the Radio Man, are shaped such that the arms should be in a pretty specific position, like here, where the left arm is leaning against the tank's interior. The other arm holds a microphone, so you do get a bit more flexibility in how this part goes on, though not too much. There's a kind of sweet spot that you'll need to find to minimise the gaps with this. Gluing the heads onto the figures is the easiest part, though do be sure that you are using the correct heads. Actually, you should be using all the correct parts and not mixing and matching bits from different crew members. 
I'm pretty sure that wouldn't work very well. If you've been around my channel for a while you'll know that I'm not the biggest fan of crew and infantry figures, I like machines more than humans, so that's my bias. But I do think, for the most part, these figures are pretty decent. I especially like the loader. He went together pretty well, especially considering that this figure has one more part than the rest. Gluing these figures into place would be the best way to get them into the correct positions and not have them falling over as soon as you move the model, but it will be much easier to paint with the crew separate, and I might still just omit them, but that's a choice for future Herbert to worry about. Anyway, you can see how they go into place. One thing I did notice was that I had some trouble getting the rear of the hull top to sit as low as I think it should. I did do a little bit of trimming after I filmed this to try and rectify that. One thing I was happy with was how well the gunner goes into place. It does shift again because it's not glued, but he can be positioned such that he's holding the traverse control and looking through the side. Very cool. Similar to the hull, the turret top doesn't quite sit all the way on the bottom part. This wouldn't matter if we were gluing it together, the glue would deal with that. But obviously this isn't going to look right with all of the parts just sitting together. Something with magnets could solve this but I can't see that being anything but horribly fiddly. The commander goes into place nicely. The one problem I have is that you can't really model him with the binoculars up to his face. It's not a real problem though. And finally, the gun slots into place on the front of the turret, right where you would expect it to go. All in all, I think it looks pretty good. It's just the fact that it doesn't quite sit perfectly together while not being glued does let it down a tiny bit. That could be down to me building it slightly wrong and not necessarily a problem with the kit. Anyway, as you might suspect, the 28mm scale King Tiger with interior from Rubicon Models is now completed, and I think it's really cool. A King Tiger by itself is a pretty cool beast, but one with an interior is even cooler. Of course this is a gaming model, and while the level of detail for a gaming model is quite high, I mean interiors for this kind of model are very rare, in fact I'm not aware of any other models in this scale for gaming that have this level of interior detail. That said, I would still say that this is primarily a gaming model and it's not going to be a super detailed display kit, so if that's what you're looking for you might be a bit disappointed. This is a pretty simple concept, but for some reason people still do expect extreme fine detail in gaming kits. Anyway, I'm really happy with this kit, and I would love to see more of this kind of thing from Rubicon in the future. The model looks great, though to be fair, Rubicon's kits are generally getting better and better. It was also quite an enjoyable build, for the most part. I didn't especially enjoy putting the figures together, but that's not really anything to do with the kit, and they're certainly not the worst figures I've ever encountered. Unsurprisingly, it did take a little bit longer to put this together than any other Rubicon kit I've built, and the reasons for that shouldn't be too hard to figure out, I would hope. This tank is also going to take a bit longer than most gaming models to paint, so definitely don't hold your breath if you're wanting to see that. However, I do want to start painting it pretty soon. I do have a bunch of other projects I'm working on, but this is very much on the to do soon list. At this point I'm not 100% sure if I'm going to paint the crew or not, but I probably will. Whether I install them in the model at the end is a different thing. I definitely want to paint the interior though, I feel like it would be pretty silly not to. I would also really like to glue it all down so that it all fits nicely, but then obviously I would make most of the interior redundant, so I think I might have to try and do a bit more careful surgery to get everything to sit together nicely with no glue. As you can see, it still doesn't do that at this point, and if I had to complain about anything, that would be it. Still, I'm quite happy with this. I understand that, at least at the time of recording, people are having a bit of trouble getting hold of this kit, and it took me a while to get mine too, and even more time before I started working on it, but I think those folks are really going to enjoy it when they do get it. It'll be worth the wait. It's also worth noting that you can get a version of this model with the Zimmeret. It is a different kit, but it should be pretty much the same. I would imagine the only things that are really different are things like the hull side and front parts that would have Zimmeret on them. A big difference between the two kits though is that the other one includes a Porsche turret, and this kit doesn't, and I've got to admit that I would have liked to have that turret as well. Oh well, we can't have everything I guess. Maybe I'll just have to get the Zimmerit version. Anyway, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to put those in the comment section below. 
If you've built one of these or any other cool models and you would like to share, why not drop by our friendly Discord community and show some pictures? We'd love to see what you've done. If you want to watch me build kits like this live on stream, head on over to my Twitch channel, because that's where I stream. The link is in the description below. And if you've not already done so, why not subscribe, follow, ring the bell, become a patron if you would like to see my videos a bit early, or maybe just come say hi on Discord or Twitch. And if you're feeling really helpful, why not share this video with your friends or anybody you think might get something out of it. Links to all of my things are in the description below, and as always, I shall return soon. So until then, be excellent to each other, have a fantastic day, and thank you for watching. Farewell.